Growing up, did you ever have one of those little fossil cleaning kits from like National Geographic or something? I know I did, and they were fun little toys. Granted, the fossils would usually not be much of anything, but it's that sense of discovery you'd get from them that really couldn't be beat. Now imagine, what if you took something as simple as a fossil cleaning kit and combined it with a creature collecting RPG? Well, you'd get fossil fighters. Hello everyone, this is the RPG Monger, and today let's go into one of my favorite games to come out of the DS and why the series would abruptly die off. Having origins dating back to before the DS even released, what with the concept being pitched in 2004, Fossil Fighters is the product of a unique combination of developers. The concept and designs coming out of Red Entertainment, Art Ding handling development, M2 handling programming, and the Nintendo Software and Planning Division contributing a variety of things. In development, the game was quite the beast of a project, with it essentially becoming multiple games in one as development progressed. To sum it all up, in Fossil Fighters, the game revolves around collecting collecting the fossils of extinct dinosaurs and some other animals, cleaning said fossils in a separate cleaning minigame, and then participating in turn-based battles with your newly revived vivisaurs. When taking a step back, it's all a pretty simple concept, but once you get into the thick of it, trying to get every vivisaur and forming the best team you can, it proves to be very effective. Though before we get into the vivisaurs themselves and the battle system surrounding them, let's talk about that cleaning minigame. Utilizing the DS touchscreen and microphone, it's all around easy to get a grip on. The three main things being using your drill for the fragile bit, using your hammer to get rid of the hard rock, and blowing away the dust you create, all the while making sure you don't actually damage the fossil inside. Sounds easy enough, sure, but once you take the time limit into consideration, and the hundreds of different fossils you can dig up, it all starts to get more complicated. For example, say you've become pretty confident in your ability to clean fossils, as you've gotten pretty high scores on your recent ones. Well, seeing that, out of nowhere, the game throws fragile fossil rocks at you that change up everything, shattering with just the touch of a hammer. Plus, with multiple different shapes the fossil rocks come in, you'll want to be as precise as possible. That is, if you want the resulting vivisaur stats to be up to snuff. And speaking of the vivisaurs, just like the cleaning minigame, the battle system of fossil fighters also appears to be pretty simple, but the further in you get, the more important it is to rely on strategy. To quickly explain it, basically, in each battle, you can have a maximum of three vivisaurs on the field, each of them in a specific position. When it comes to the vivisaurs themselves, they each have a set number of attacks and abilities depending on which parts of their fossils you've cleaned, with those set attacks only being available if you have enough FP, points you use to fight that recharge after each turn. Like other games, Fossil Fighters utilizes a type system, with most vivisaurs having an element they're strong against and weak against, that is, unless they're neutral. So of course, in battle, you'd want to match up vivisaurs that are strong against your opponent's team. Hell, they even show you what you're up against before for the fight. But wait, that's only half of the battle system, because alongside the actual vivisaurs, there's those positions I mentioned. Four to be exact, the attack zone, two support zones, and the escape zone. Like it sounds, the attack zone is where you want to put your main attacker, or if you play the game like I did, a beefy vivisaur to soak up damage while a long-ranged vivisaur dishes out damage from the support zone. And in the support zone, you place vivisaurs that, well, support the one you placed in the attack zone. Or alternatively, a apply debuffs to the opposing team. Though what if your AZ Vivisaur takes too much damage? Well, then there's the Escape Zone, a place you can send the hurt Vivisaur to be safe for the time being. And honestly, that's just scratching the surface of how you can use the zones. So yeah, at least gameplay-wise, that's the core of Fossil Fighters, a unique little game with a pretty engaging gameplay loop. As I myself personally enjoyed it as a kid, I wonder how the game was received overall. Oh boy, here we go. Mediocre, huh? Looks like it's a mystery dungeon all over over again. Which is funny considering it's the same guy who wrote that awful review. I wonder what kind of insightful points they have to offer this time. The game has a bit of charm, but the design attempts to be so much like Pokemon, it's almost shameless. Okay, we're doing this, are we? The age-old- oh, that's a game you can fight with creatures you collect? Nah, it's a Pokemon ripoff. Like, come on. It's like calling Sonic a Mario ripoff because they're both platformers. You know, just for the sake of it, let's list off how many similarities Fossil Fighters has with Pokemon. Maybe the guy's right, what do I know? For one, they both have turn-based battle systems and use elemental types. Pretty incriminating, I know. It's not like there's a franchise that predates Pokemon and does the exact same thing. And when it comes to reviving fossils, Pokemon does that as well, albeit in a far more limited and basic fashion. Clearly, the devs of 
of Fossil Fighters had no originality. Oh, and who could forget the fact that both games have evil teams as part of their plots? Granted, Fossil Fighters uses its evil team in a far different way, and ends up having entirely different antagonists towards the end, but hey, it's more than obvious this guy only played for a couple hours before writing a review. Though on that note, to take me out of this rant, let's talk about the story of Fossil Fighters, surprisingly one of the game's greatest assets. Starting out, the plot is pretty simple, with you the protagonist going around the aptly named Vivasaur Island, reviving fossils to compete in the Fossil Stadium. At first, the story consists of pretty simple chapters, introducing characters like Rosie, a spoiled energetic girl who happens to be the granddaughter of the island's owner, Dr. Diggins, the resident Vivasaur expert of the island, and the game's initial villains, the BB Bandits, a crime syndicate whose members you end up fighting throughout the game. So after a few semi-self-contained chapters, each involving a new dig site with its own wacky little story, in chapter 4, the grand scheme of the plot begins being sprinkled in with the introduction of the character Duna. She doesn't do much now, but just you wait. She'll be pretty important soon, as after chapter 5, where it's revealed that the BB bandits were only pawns to some greater force, using them to take these weird idols you've been collecting throughout the game. In chapter 6, after the protagonist digs up the fourth idol, Duna tries to take it by force before all of a sudden, her holographic disguise malfunctions, revealing her to be some kind of reptilian alien. At this point, I'm practically certain that the guy who made that lackluster review had long stopped playing. So after defeating her in a fossil battle where she herself took part in by transforming into a vivisaur, the chapter isn't over yet, as back in town, the BB bandits have returned, taking over the town through the power of a legendary vivisaur. And while this part of the game is pretty great, I'm not gonna talk about it too much in detail because once you beat the BB boss's Frigisaurus with the Ignosaurus, the plot takes a complete 180. After the BB Bandit's plotline is resolved, it's revealed that the idols you've been collecting are actually advanced alien technology that the Dinarians, the alien race Duna is a part of, plan to use in order to make the human race extinct. Pretty big change from chasing around petty criminals, right? Well then, after fighting Raptin, another Dinarian that's not as understanding as Duna and getting a proper disguise, the protagonist and Dr. Diggins infiltrate the Dinarian mothership, deciphering the grand plan of the aliens. Basically, and this is revealed over the course of a few segments in the game, way back in prehistoric times, a massive planet-eating space monster named Ganash destroyed the homeworld of the Dinarians, forcing what was left of their population to take the space in order to find a new home. In turn, after a long search, the perfect planet for them to settle on was found. Earth. The only problem was, it wasn't suited for them at the time. So to fix that problem, they'd seed the planet with life that on their original planet eventually evolved into them, in the hopes that the same could take place on Earth. To make sure nothing went wrong, the idol comps were created, computers that would monitor the life, and if anything went wrong, the main idol comp located on the mothership would make corrections. So now, you kinda understand why the Dinarians were trying so hard to retrieve those weird idols. But that's not all you learn, as also, while the Dinarians waited for the seeded life to evolve into more Dinarians, they'd be placed in a state of artificial fossilization known as Stone Sleep, waiting to be revived just like you've been reviving Vivisaurs the entire game. Interesting how the processes for the two are similar, right? Well, we'll get back to that. Going deeper into the mothership, the protagonist reaches the main idol comp room, with none other than the king of all Dinarians inside of it, Dinal. Currently arguing with Duna as the two disagree on whether to exterminate the human race or not, Luckily enough, before Dinal manages to force Duna out of the way to activate the main idol comp, the protagonist manages to distract him as Dr. Diggins removes one of the sub-idol comps to prevent the rest from working. So hooray, the day is saved, or at least it would be in any other game, as the Fossil Fighters writers just kept pushing things further, this time throwing time travel into the mix. Because as a result of Dr. Diggins removing one of the sub-idol comps, the main one goes haywire, releasing an energy surge, sending him and that sub-idol comp all the way back to the Jurassic period. In turn, one fetch quest later to retrieve the fragments of that sub-idol comp, it's revealed that pretty much all the fossil restoration technology in the game actually came from a Dinarian scout ship that crashed millions of years ago. And once you physically go to the crash site, you discover that Dickens just barely survived by using stone sleep, leading to a pretty hilarious bit where you have to clean his fossil. But now, we're in the endgame, with pretty much everything else being resolved, the only thing left 
enough to do is challenge Dinal. So one crazy battle later, it seems like that'd be the end of things. What with the king realizing the error in his ways, and even though humans only existed because of Dinarians, they had no right to get rid of them. Except nope, with two opportunities to end the game now, the writers were still not satiated. As remember wrapped in that one guy I barely mentioned? Well, right before the humans and Dinarians were going to part in peace, he just wasn't having it and activated the main idol comp anyways. Though instead of every person being obliterated immediately, the sub idol comps actually begin speaking, revealing that humans didn't descend from the organisms planted by the Dinarians, and that those organisms went extinct themselves. When this happened millions of years ago, the sub idol comps unanimously agreed to observe the life developing on Earth rather than destroying it, but they encountered a fatal problem. In response to the plan failing, the main idol comp disagreed and decided that in order to remove all anomalous factors, all native life on Earth had to be annihilated. The issue was, none of the alien ships had that capability, so instead, it sent out a signal to the only thing that could, Ganache. Yup, that's right, in this funny little dino game, the finale of Fossil Fighters consists of you preventing an apocalypse of incredible proportions and stopping a massive space tadpole from eating the world. And of course, the only way to stop it is by going inside the beast and defeating the three bizarre brains that control it in a fossil battle. Clearly a one-to-one -one ripoff of Pokemon, I mean, come on. So yeah, that's pretty much the story of Fossil Fighter is as condensed as I could tell it. Looking back, the game was honestly a perfect representation of the DS's spirit, taking a concept that's pretty widely well known by the public and putting a spin on it, creating something entirely new. It's just a shame that with most reviewers probably not playing the game to completion and barely doing it justice, I'm confident many people blew the game off without even touching it. Though thankfully, despite that nonsense, the game would still receive an acceptable amount of attention, giving the devs enough reason to create a sequel. Fossil Fighters Champions, coming out late into 2010 in Japan and 2011 in America, at least timing-wise, the game didn't come out at the best time for DS games, considering that when it was localized, the 3DS had been out for months. Though past that, the combo of devs that made the first installment do not disappoint, as in my opinion, Champions is for the most part a direct step up from the original. I mean hell, just from the most basic perspective, the game added a good amount of new Vivasaurs to the roster, diversifying the designs of a lot too, with the addition of even more non-dinosaur fossils. Like just look at some of these new ones, in Champions you can even fight with a prehistoric fish. Plus just in general, while I'm not the kind of person who really bats an eye at bad graphics as long as the gameplay's good, Champions definitely upgraded the visuals quite a bit, even adding little animated cutscenes. Granted they are DS quality, so they're not the most incredible things in the world, but I always thought they were cool as a kid, especially those ones in Kirby Superstar Ultra. But I'm getting off topic. To start off, let's look at the gameplay changes, as pretty much every part of the original was modified in some way. First, let's talk about the core of the game, fossil cleaning. You see, in the original, it was a fun little minigame, although after you've been doing it for the entire game and upgraded your tools to the max, the lack of variety outside of things like the shape and hardness of the rocks does dampen the minigame a bit. However, in Champions, that's entirely resolved, as on top of the core mechanics from the original, a lot more variety was sprinkled in with larger rocks, double-sided rocks, and miraculous fossil rocks, to name a few. Plus, if you're lucky, sometimes by hitting certain points on the rock, you can get part of it to shatter, aiding the cleaning process greatly when it happens. Overall, just the right amount of additions to the minigame. However, when it came to the battle system, a lot would be changed. While the game would continue utilizing the typing system it established, the zone-centric combat would be altered through the removal of the escape zone. Now, fossil battles revolve around the formation you choose, with each vivisaur being either long-ranged, middle ranged or short ranged, thus becoming more powerful when you place them in the correct positions. Plus alongside the addition of that, to replace the escape zone, champions added rotation, allowing you to rotate the position of each vivisaur as you see fit, and sometimes forcefully rotate the enemy's positions if you have the right skill. In my opinion, it was a pretty great change and added a lot more variety and strategy to the game. Though with the main gameplay elements touched on, all that's left is the game's story. Would it hold up to how crazy things got in the original? 
original? Well, kinda. Just like the first game, the story of Champions doesn't take itself very seriously, with arcs like being swallowed by a massive whale and fighting its tonsil to escape being sprinkled in. Although alongside story beats like those, Champions still managed to pull a crazy twist towards the end. But we'll get to that. Starting out, in the beginning of the game, Champions isn't too different from the original, the first few chapters serving to introduce you to characters and what look like the game's antagonists, the Bare Bones Brigade, yet another criminal syndicate. If I had to pinpoint anything, the largest difference from the original is the fact you actually get to choose which Vivisaur you start out with, receiving one from the aptly named character, Joe Wild West. With a name like that, you'd think he's just a random side character, but believe it or not, later on, he becomes very important. Though getting back on track, in Fossil Fighters Champions, unlike the first game that took place on one big island with a few side locations, Champions takes place on the Calioseo Islands, each island having three dig sites. And wouldn't you know it, that Joe guy owns all of them, inviting Fossil Fighters from all over the world to take part in a tournament, passing over ownership of the island to whoever emerges victorious. So with that base, honestly the story writes itself for a while, each chapter developing and introducing new characters with wacky story beats serving as a backdrop for it all. Though after a little bit, just like the first game, little bits of information would start being revealed about the island's past, mainly about the ancient civilization that lived there. To summarize, long ago the Calioseo Islands were ruled by an all-powerful sorcerer named Zonga Zonga, who in his heyday had enough power to actually create vivisaurs. In turn, so that his rule would never be interrupted, Zonga Zonga would host tournaments, giving people the vivisaurs he'd created, and once someone emerged the victor, they would become host to the sorcerer, Zonga Zonga migrating from one body to the next in order to both maintain his rule and immortality. But no need to worry, thankfully his people grew tired of his tyranny and managed to overthrow Zonga Zonga at some point by sealing his skull in a chest. But hold on, isn't that Joe guy kind of doing the same thing as Zonga Zonga with the tournament he's holding? That's pretty suspicious, isn't it? Not to mention, whereas in the original the BB bandits were purely criminals, the Bare Bones Brigade of Champions are more focused, solely trying to postpone or stop the tournament from proceeding, which is also pretty suspicious. Well, keeping that in mind, it turns out there actually is more to it than meets the eye, as when the protagonist inevitably wins the tournament and meets with Joe to receive the island, it's revealed that Joe actually is Zonga Zonga, having stolen the body of the real Joe when he mistakenly released Zonga Zonga from his chest. In turn, just like the record said, the big twist of champions was that the tournament was all an elaborate plot for Zonga Zonga to obtain a better vessel. And it doesn't stop there. After narrowly escaping the sorcerer and becoming a fugitive, since the fake Joe announced they were in league with the Bare Bones Brigade, the protagonist and friends take refuge with the very same group, it being revealed that the leader of the brigade is actually the real Joe Wild West, reduced to merely his skull after Zonga Zonga took his body. So with the help of your friends and the brigade, the protagonist manages to knock Zonga Zonga's skull out of Joe's body, saving the day. Except hold on, if we've learned anything from the previous game, these stories don't end that easily, as while escaping, Zonga Zonga managed to possess one of your friends, gaining access to more of his old powers and raising a massive fortress out of the sea to conquer the world from. In turn, after modifying a cannon to shoot a person, the protagonist gets shot up to the fortress and takes down the evil sorcerer once and for all, this time saving the day for real. Sure, it's no sci-fi story involving planet-eating tadpoles and space aliens, but I still enjoyed it all the same. More than anything, it shows that the Fossil Fighters devs were more than capable of creating quality sequels, taking advantage of the DS in pretty much every way they could. The real question is, how would the game perform compared to its predecessor? Well, unfortunately, not that great. You see, for the original, Fossil Fighters actually sold more in America than it did in Japan, so even though the game came out before the 3DS's release in its home country, the game coming out many months after the 3DS in America did its sales no favors. And of course, IGN and other reviewers were back at it again, calling the game a Pokemon ripoff, so I definitely put some of the blame there too. But there you have it. Even though both games didn't do amazingly, they were solid DS titles, ending off the series on a high note. At least, that's what I'd like to say. To the dismay of anyone who enjoyed the first two games in the series, and to me who was blissfully ignorant of this title before writing this video, multiple years after the release of Champions, there would still be one more Fossil Fighters game.
So before we go into this thing, let's shift focus off of Fossil Fighters for a second and talk about its developers. You see, the main thing that made Fossil Fighters work was its unique group of developers. It was a delicate balance of talent, and unfortunately, it wasn't meant to last. First on the chopping block is Red Entertainment, the company that came up with Fossil Fighters in the first place alongside designing characters and Vivasaurs would be bought out only a year after Champions by Chinese game developer Ultizen, a company that primarily makes mobile games. And that's not all, because three years later, Red Entertainment would be sold off to the Oizumi Corporation, a company that primarily makes pachinko machines among other things. So needless to say, the company would go through a lot of change, and that wouldn't be the end of it, as alongside Red, Nintendo SPD, another large contributor in development, would go through a lot as well. You see, Nintendo SPD was a division of the company created by then-president Satoru Iwata back in 2003. Alongside developing and experimenting with new software, it also developed games games with third-party developers. Well, with a new general manager replacing Iwata as head of the division in 2013, the division would undergo a good bit of change, being relocated and later merged with another division. Now granted, there's a good chance none of this had any bearing whatsoever when it came to the development of the third game, but for whatever reason, when it came time to make the third Fossil Fighters game, it wouldn't be the same group of developers as before. This time, while some people from Red would still be involved with the title, all development would would be outsourced to Spike Chunsoft, which isn't exactly an incompetent company, right? They've made good games in the past, so there shouldn't be anything to worry about. Well, for better or for worse, let's talk about Fossil Fighters Frontier. Alright, here we go. Opening up with an incredibly cheesy song, Fossil Fighters Frontier is practically an entirely different game from the first two entries, and not in a good way. Like, I'm nearly convinced that not a single person at Spike Chunsoft even beat the first two games. Why do I say that? Well, you'll see why. Before we get into any of the other BS, let's talk Vivasaurs. After all, they're the core basis of the franchise. In the first two games, much like you'd expect, every main Vivasaur while being based off of real prehistoric animals, were pretty stylized, with a consistent art style being clearly seen with each design. Whether the new devs even saw these designs, who can say? But when Frontier came out, nearly every design fans had acquainted themselves with would be either replaced entirely or heavily altered. Like, just look at some of these new designs. Half of the Vivasaurs just look weird and gross now, with the kind of realistic approach they attempted. It's like when Pokemon almost had its designs changed when localizing the first games to America, nearly every stylized Vivasaur was now replaced with uninspired designs with an emphasis on their teeth. Hell, they even removed a lot of Vivasaurs, with every non-dinosaur from the first two games being ditched. Why would they do this? Well, I have a theory of sorts, and it expands to the rest of the game as well. When it came to developing Frontier, the game was clearly made to specifically target kids, more so than the first two games. Because just from my perspective, I only played the first game when I was young, only now when making this video playing through Champions, and I genuinely enjoyed it. While the first two are made for a younger demographic, I feel anyone can enjoy them no matter the age. Though with Frontier, that is not the case. In fact, I doubt even younger me would enjoy Frontier, as the game has far more glaring problems than the subpar designs. One of them being cars. Much like other great franchises that fell under the car curse, instead of being able to walk around areas and dig up fossils, most of Frontier takes place in a car. It's almost as if Spike Chun Soft was already developing a racing game and decided to just work that into a new Fossil Fighters. Hell, if the characters didn't have portraits in their text boxes, a great deal of the game would just be cars talking to each other. Not to mention, at least for me, it got kind of annoying being restricted to car controls for a lot of the game. But enough on that. Before we get to the worst aspect of the game, how would the cleaning minigame fare? Well, thankfully, this is the one part of the game they couldn't really mess up even if they tried. Granted, I will say it did feel a whole lot easier to get high-scoring fossils than it did in the first two, but that may be a personal thing. Plus, unlike the first two, now you can both restore fossils on the spot and from any fossil, which was a decent quality of life improvement. However, what isn't a personal thing is the new battle system, because it is quite possibly one of the worst battle systems I've ever seen in an RPG. You ever play one of those RPGs where you're only capable of controlling the main character in battle? Like the original Persona 3, for example. Well, 
Fossil Fighters Frontier, a game made in 2015, may I remind you, does just that. Remember all the strategy the first two games had, with things like picking the right vivisaurs for your team and utilizing zones? Well, too bad. Say bye-bye to all that, because in many parts of Frontier, the game restricts how many vivisaurs of your own you can send out, with the open slots on your side being filled by the vivisaurs of your allies, controlled by AI. Now that's already bad enough, but it gets much worse. Take the pacing of battles. It's something most games don't mess up, as you're usually able to make all the important decisions yourself. Or in the case of other games that utilize AI-controlled allies, their turns go by quick enough to not slow down the flow of battle. In Frontier, this shouldn't have even been a problem, what with the first two games giving each side one turn, allowing multiple vivisaurs to attack per turn based on how much FP is used. Who needs any of that, though? In Frontier, now every vivisaur gets its own turn, slowing many battles down to a crawl. Of course, with that change, it makes no sense to keep the FP system the same way it was in the other games, right? What is this, a competent game? Yeah, they kept the FP system. It's literally one of the only remnants of the old games, meaning a good bit of the time, your AI allies can straight up use all the FP, leaving you unable to even attack when your turn finally comes around. Like, with them also adding a time limit for you to attack for some reason, I found myself able to just let my DS sit and win the battle without me even doing a single thing. Though to be absolutely fair, they did add a few new mechanics, like having a limited number of boosts you can use to strengthen certain stats temporarily, and the stance system, where certain vivisaurs are stronger in a specific stance, being affected by stance-changing attacks. But at the end of the day, it's just not fun. If you're making a turn-based RPG and the battle system bores the player more than it excites them, you've essentially failed on the most fundamental level. And I'm sure these changes were yet again simplifications to appeal more to kids, but there was no need to change this much. Hell, Frontier even messed with the elemental system, swapping the positions of Earth and Air for absolutely no logical reason. <sighs> it just makes me sad, man, seeing what was once a fantastic innovative series being dumbed down to this schlock. If anything, I'd say the only new mechanic I actually found interesting was the new system of being able to swap out moves on your Vivisaur once you acquire special fossils. It's just a shame things like that are bogged down by everything else. Oh yeah, and then there's the story. An evil scientist breaks out of prison and you have to stop him from going to the past and brainwashing dinosaurs. That's just about it. The only other thing of note being the addition of the protagonist having a set partner vivisaur for the entire game. And the only real twist there is that the vivisaur used to be a test subject for that evil scientist. Coinciding with the rest of the game, Frontier's story is probably the most uninspired part of it all, containing subpar dialogue and a vast array of one-dimensional characters. You see this guy? His character is he's chubby and rolls into people. Wow, that's some next level stuff. Or how about this girl? Her character is she likes to race. That's it. Pretty much the entire game consists of stuff on this level. Plus, with the addition of that partner Vivisaur, as long as you take part in tournaments to keep it at a good level, you can straight up use it for most of the game, rarely ever having to rely on any other Vivisaur as you revive. And let me say, it's not like the stories in the first two games were groundbreaking either. It's just that you could tell actual effort went into it, producing a plot that neatly accompanies the gameplay. In Frontier, it's almost like the devs were more focused on meeting a quota rather than producing something of quality. And just like the move swapping system, the story also has little parts that could have been much better. Like this one character who helps you throughout the game turning out to be a space-time engineer who travels through time to maintain the stability of space-time. If only the rest of the plot had more interesting things like that. At the end of the day, it's honestly sad to see such a great game series from my childhood be killed off like this. Because even though it's clear that they simplified things to appeal specifically to younger kids, Fossil Fighters Frontier was would sell abysmally, not even reaching half a million sales. And thus, with Nintendo moving on from the 3DS line a couple years later, it's safe to say that aside from a mention in Smash, Fossil Fighters is now officially extinct. Looking past the disgrace that is Frontier, I would recommend all of you to try out the first two games if you get the chance. They honestly hold up very well and can become very addicting if you try to craft the best team to take down your foes. And if you're someone whose only experience with the franchise is Frontier, please, you owe it to yourself to play one of the other games. I feel sorry for anyone who had to be subjected to Frontier. You know, even though the Switch has been getting no shortage of fantastic titles, a part of me definitely misses games like Fossil 
fossil fighters coming out. And hey, who knows, maybe one day in the future, just like in the games, this fossil of a franchise will be resurrected once more. Hopefully this time, living up to its former glory. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more like it, do subscribe! And today's cool thing of the day is Persona 4 Golden. With the game recently being brought to Steam, I've been seriously having a blast playing through it on my Twitch. Like wow, I am so glad I never spoiled myself for it, because the music so far in the game has been out of this world. If only for that, I'd highly recommend it. And speaking of my Twitch, here's my new outro segment, the Twitch clip of the day. What? Ooh, ooh. <laughs> so that being said, I'm the RPG Monger, and don't forget that each and every one of you are fantastic.